Speaker, we think that it's bad that parties see an incentive to stay in power, to consolidate more power when they're when they're in in the government, as opposed to serving the people to the utmost extent. We think that when you allow party hopping policies, when you allow people to change uh, to jump ship, this means that the priority then becomes to have more people within a certain party for as long as you could. Right? Our stance is simple. We think that we're happy to defend that people that politicians shouldn't party hop before or after elections. And that if, sh if you've shown loyalty towards a certain party, you should, you should not uh, jump ship. We are, we are also happy with politicians that will, will want to join these parties, who are politicians who are independent with no party at all, uh, who, might, uh, who might also have progressive ideas, but also new individuals to uh, new individuals who who were never involved in politics in the first place, we think that this means that it's going to be a lot more involvement uh, on the ground, right? So. Um, the enforcement is simple. We're fine with fining them if they don't follow this and barring them from going to election uh, altogether. Moving on to my principal justification, right? We think it's necessarily important to note that not let, allowing jump sh uh, politicians to jump ship is extremely unjust to the people, right? There are a few kinds of people who vote for politicians. We think that some people look to, uh, like some people consider the identity of the politicians, for instance, like it's, if it's a woman, if it's a progressive politician, things like that. But there are, there are also people who vote because of the manifesto of the party in itself. This means that they will want to see reforms within the uh, uh, institutions of accountability, they want, to, they want to see economic reforms, and they don't want 
but corruption. We think that there are a lot of people who vote for PH because of all these principles. And we think that, essentially, when you allow politicians to jump ship, we think that you inevitably uh, 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 transforms to a different version of what you've presented, right? This means that now, people are literally voting for a different party that they initially wanted to vote for. Which means that this is against with what people have chosen. So we think that essentially you betray the people on the ground. Not yet. So, um, moving on to my arguments. Like, first thing, what's exactly the incentive of party hoppers to modify the party line and the policies and stances of a, a particular party? We think that it's important to note that the incentive of Jump at uh, party hoppers is usually because they don't want to be in the losing team. They want to get. They want to reap the benefits of being in the winning party. We think that's important to note, right? So, what exactly are they gonna do when they party hop? We think it's most likely first day they're gonna uh, like they have they have a con uh, so they've won a constituency for instance, right? So they have a particular voter base. This means that if for instance if they hop from AMNO to PH, it will still be holding to what the people want. What does this mean then? So they would do things like not support supporting the current government, the party that, that they are in, in certain stances, in certain, uh, in certain uh, a, a passing of a legislation, right? This means that it's likely for them to not support the party line and not being principally aligned to the current government. And we've seen this happen, how people don't want to, like, uh, how people don't want to say anything about certain progressive things because they were initially from, I don't know, uh, before I move on, sure. What is your metric to when the politician changes their political affiliation? Uh, I already told you. Uh, uh, yeah, like so, we are not okay with suddenly them wanting to jump ship. Like uh, from uh, that means like so. So jumping from AMNO to PH is clearly like you're changing principles, right? And we think that you often see people jump ship when it's nearing the elections. So you already see the incentive structures of that particular, uh, uh, that, that particular group of politicians in the first place. And we think that they would have to defend people jumping ship like, uh, due to like, wanting to accrue the benefits of being in the winning party. But secondly, we think that it's also the fact that politicians will also follow their personal belief. For instance, like, like a Malay nationalist, for instance, like some, some who's like religiously orthodox. And they're likely not want to follow uh, what Whatever that's being uh, pro uh, whatever that's being proposed by the current government, that the party they're in, this means that it m it will most likely distort the manifesto of the the winning party, right? And this means that you don't actually serve people with whatever that they want. We think that this of so why is this necessarily impact impactful towards people as a whole? Because this means that you affect the decision-making process in federal government. Once you're in the parliament, you would have a say in the legislative matters. And these legislative matters affect people as a whole. It doesn't matter if you voted them in or if you didn't, you'd still be affected by these people. And the fact that these people, they suddenly jump ship and then they don't want to comply with the principles of this particular government, it means that the government would lose out on the things that they're fighting for, like more progressive laws and things like that. We think this is a necessary harm on their side. We think it's yeah, yeah. We think it's harder for them to push for progressive norms. Then, sure. So, if a politician feels that their constituency feels that the racial minority should be protected, and their political party does not allow that, what happens on the other side? So they would. So I don't think that they should have been in that political party in the first place. I think they should have known the nuances of that party they are in and understand like they should have been in a different one. Or oh, we're okay with them having their own political party and then uh, yeah, and then like protecting their minorities and things like that. But now moving on to the second thing, right? So I think like we can. So I'm just gonna say that they probably say that if Mahadeh hadn't hopped into uh, PH, they would have not won. However, we think that it's important to note that our stance is we think that PH would still have won. But even if they did, it would still be better on a state level because you're able to preserve the the core principles of that particular party. But give, let me give you reasons why we'd still be able to get into power. It's firstly because a lot of people voted for PH because if they they are anti-establishment, right? This means that the minorities, the social class, and the working class are, are frustrated with the incumbent government. This means that there's always an 
incentive to change the government, right? We think that this incentive has been there for a long time. You can see in GE 13, where, PH, uh, where PKR has already won, but they lost in the ele electoral college. This means that people on the ground in itself have the incentive to want to change government. But also, it's the rhetoric of like, uh, it's the corruption thing, right? How incumbent government has like all their dirty laundry and people resonate with it. So even if you say that if Mahathir wasn't there, uh, they wouldn't have won, we think that it would still have because of these things that, uh, uh, that the other party vote for. We think that to stay in power, you don't necessarily need party hoppers, right? We think that in fact, you lose power because of these party hoppers because the perception then becomes your priority is to stay in power and to consolidate more power as opposed to serving the people with the manifesto that you've sold. We think it's extremely important for representatives of the state to serve their people first as opposed yeah. to consolidate more power and to stay in power. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it is extremely sad that while Ida is a law student who frequently talks to me about politics, she doesn't understand what politicians do and what politicians need in order to properly represent their people, ladies and gentlemen. I think in this debate, you have to understand the multiple reasons and the multiple values that politicians have when they party hop or when they are in that particular manner, especially when you're talking about corrupt governments, when you're talking about governments that no longer or misrepresent individuals at the end of the day, you cannot operate in the best case scenario that side, op that side government wants to, which is only talking about a benevolent government, only talking about one government that is progressive, that fights for the rights of some individuals or liberal individuals under their side of the house. I think it is completely ridiculous because this debate is not only about Malaysia, it is also about the multiple democracies that exist all across the world, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, you can hear here later, guys. Right, so first of all, just a few clarifications and a bit of setup coming out from side government opposition, right? So, first of all, clarification as to the motion, right? We just do not support any, uh, so we do, we are okay with individuals wanting to party hop, probably being due to either they do not agree with the policies and values of that government yeah. at that moment of time or of their party, or probably because they cater and think that is that is important for them to represent the will of the people more over the will of other parties in that particular state, ladies and gentlemen. Right? But number two, when we are talking about I'm politicians honest. who party hop, sit down, take later, who uh, politicians who party hop, I think we are also talking about individuals uh, who are not of, of the extreme right or of the extreme left or of the higher hierarchy within that political party. We're talking about individuals who probably are of lesser or, or, or of the low ranking or low ranking places within that hierarchy. Individuals who are of the center left or center right and it's usually these individuals who change their stance from time to time because they do not have a strong affiliation to that party, political uh, political party, right ladies and gentlemen. And it's like completely ridiculous stuff because I don't think that if you have a high position in the hierarchy, if you have like represented PH's value from time ever since they were built and they were created, I don't think these individuals would leave that party party and party hop all of a sudden, I just do not see why is that, that is the case under their side of the house. Right? They need to tell us why they don't have, why these politicians who party hop do not have a right to affiliate themselves to whatever political parties or political values they want at the end of the day. Right? But just a couple of rebuttals that do not fit into whatever sentence I have. Number one, when they tell you that this, like, uh, that the moment a politician party hops, the values of that political party then change. Uh, number one, I don't see why this is the reason, right? Because if one person hops away from or changes from PH to BN, I don't think like PH will suddenly become conservative or PH will suddenly change its values at the end of the day. I think it's completely ridiculous. Even if they do, they need to show it to you and prove to you why that values that political party uh, get, like uh, ruins or changes and transforms with the party hopping of that one individual, especially if that individual is not the main hierarchy or the top hierarchy of that political party, ladies and gentlemen. But number two, they also tell you that the government will lose out um, on the things that they are fighting for the 
moment that an individual party hops, right? Um, I think this pro- like probably uh, like probably even if that happens only in the best of governments that they're talking about, the most benevolent governments. But when you talk about a government that is extremely corrupt, a government who has uh, like ha- has embezzled m- m- multiple funds of uh, uh, from people, I think when you talk about these political parties, is you maintain the corruption and the policies that are related to corruption that will still be propagated when individuals are no longer allowed to uh, party hop at the end of the day. I'll show you why this is extremely bad, and I'll show you why that corruption then uh, continues to prolong at the end of the day. Two arguments. Number one, I'll tell you why um, why uh, polit- uh, politicians have the right to freedom of political expression, um, and this engages with this whole idea of how uh, politicians will follow their own personal beliefs argument coming out from Ida, right? So first of all, when you talk about freedom of political expression, uh, a lot of times politicians uh, are like, uh, there, there's a freedom as to which you express your own political ideology, right? There are probably reasons why an, an individual becomes a politician in order for them to properly represent the, uh, the uh, people of that country, also probably just because they want individuals to be more informed of the policies that could cater better for that people, right? I think there are, like this uh, principle in of itself is one that is independent of whatever out- outcome when you talk about politicians, right? Because like the freedom of expression, of political expression to a politician is one that is directly inherent to them. When they become a politician, they are free to pick whatever political party that they want or whatever political values that they see are deemed fit for not only them, but for the people of that country, right? Because a lot of times politicians are voted in by the will and the mandate of the individual. So the, per- the first person or the first entity that a politician has to cater to is the values of that individual at the end of the day or the values of this, those citizens at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, right? The simple moral parallel that we have to freedom of political expression is how we also allow voters to always change and always change their opinion and their own political expression when it comes to voting, right? I think that same freedom of expression should also apply to individuals who are a politician or individuals who are from a political party, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, right? But also people change all the time and uh, over time because of due to things like being more educated about the problems within that country, probably being more exposed to the uh, to the plights and rights of minority individuals, ladies and gentlemen, or probably pro- or just probably constituency, constituencies may want them to change at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, right? The converse that we have on, on, on site government is then that you restrict them from creating change that is better for your country and better for your people, because even if they have diff- they no longer align with the political values of that party, you still force them to propagate the values that are no longer good for individuals of that country. We think that is extremely detrimental when you talk to a de- uh, when you talk about a democracy, when you talk about political representation, ladies and gentlemen. Sure. PH was actively promoting about fundamental rights, but now when they've accept, accepted some UMNO politicians, they'll have to tone down. But is this scrutinizing the women's march? Engage. Uh, no, 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 no. They did not tone down due to political, like due to people party hopping into their party. Yeah, yeah. They probably turned down due to like, you know, the perception of individuals or how they were criti- uh, like heavily criticized by other governments. This is not due to party hopping. They need to prove why it's so, right? Well, second part on this, right? Uh, right, like, why exactly is this right more important than the obligation that they have to their party, right? I think number one, when you talk about it, the obligation is mainly to voters and not the party in of itself because they are direct, direct representation, right? But number two is also probably they just do not feel that the party itself uh, like it no longer represents and no longer agree with the political positions that the current party and the political positions that the, cur- uh, the political values that the current party has, which is why they would want to change that party, right? If they're in a corrupt government, you force them to stay in that corrupt government later in general, right? But number two, how this emboldens, uh, emboldens the parties that are corrupt and they are no longer uh, what is uh, and that no longer serve the people, right? So these particular individuals or uh, politicians are usually who party hop are usually individuals who are in total desperation, right? They have no power in changing the narrative, the policies, and the values that that party has. And mostly uh, these individuals are in the gray area or in the low ranking hierarchies of that polit- polit- political party, right? They are stuck in that party and they are forced to pander to party values. Uh, values are not only against their own belief and their own ideology, but also against the beliefs of individuals and citizens on the ground, ladies and gentlemen, right? That means that that party, when you force them to stay in that party, that means that that political party that is then corrupt has uh, more of a power to get more seats, has more of a power to get more legislation and more power to change the legislations that are on the ground that just do not benefit the people, but rather it benefits the political parties in and of itself and allows them to prolong the corruption, prolong the, uh, the, the harm that they've done onto citizens of that state. For all those reasons, go with opposition. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, 
There was a bizarre moment in Malaysian history that was full of zeal. It was when we believed in the true Malaysia. It was when we believed there was a chance for real change. What followed afterwards it was a, a stream of tumultuous party hopping where you saw politicians coming from Amno and went to Pakatan Harapan. One year later, as we reach the anniversary of what was supposed to be a revolutionary election, we see the reversal of all the politicians and the manifestos and the policies that Pakatan initially favoured for. That A, now we allow politicians to hate GLCs and essentially funnel money to GLCs, and B, the fact that they turn a blind eye to the stoning of the LGBT in Kelantan, the fact is that these parties, that these politicians will, will, will like, taint the message and purity of initial ruling governments, they needed to engage with that context. I'm going to talk about three things, and I'm going to classify as the three Ps. First, principle. Second, power. Third, prayed off. First, on principle. I'd like to give you reasons to believe that party hopping is not only a bad political strategy, but inherently unjust. It was not democratic given that you voted in a government to represent you. What was the response we had from Ash? Ash sort of, uh, uh, sort of like, uh, responses with sort of counter um, like, like, like counter principles. So he says that politicians no longer have a strong affiliation with that, poli with, with that policy. Well, according to their logic and according to them, this politician joins because this, they had a sudden change of heart. That suddenly they realize that corruption is not important. Despite being 50 years of AMNO, despite being complicit in the oppression of AMNO, suddenly they had a nice change of heart, an altruistic change of heart, and now join Pakatan. We, on the other hand, provide you a different reason. That is, politicians entered AMNO and Pakatan by virtue of political strategy. That they joined not to, by virtue of an actual change in decision making, but often it's because of notions of power that they wanted to enter the federal government. They never wanted to engage with that context. Our context is a lot more reasonable. But crucially, stop, stop, stop. When Ash says that Pakistan Harapan's values will not transform, that does not engage with the five layers of analysis that Ida gives you. That firstly, you are likely going to allow many, many party hoppers to join this Pakatan Harapan. Why? Because if the incentive is to join is to of Pakatan in accepting uh, uh, in, in accepting different politicians is to enter into power, then the incentive is also to attract as many party hoppers as possible. Because that means that you end up controlling a lot more municipalities and you end up controlling a lot more districts. The incentive is to not attract one or two. The incentive is to attract a lot. That's why you see in the news it's not just one politician. It's many, many politicians from Amno who join Pakatan. That's why it translates to federal policies. Insofar as it means that they can translate that to the policies. That Pakistan initially had. Sit. Second, you allow them in because of the power they hold i.e. the bargaining chip is not with Pakatan, the bargaining chip is with those politicians. Because you as Pakatan want those constituencies. They don't need you, all they get is a marginal amount of power, but you, on the other hand, get a district to win as Pakatan. So the bargaining chip is essentially in their hands, the negotiation chip is in their hands. And what that looks like in a party setting is the whip having to compromise to their view as opposed to the initial party stance because they want to keep you in that party. That's how it looks like they have to deal with the nuances of politics. Sit. Third, Personal belief, never engage with that. Fourth, you're beholden to constituencies, constituents who want to see their policies. That means that you as a politician, let's say you're in Kelantan, you need to show that you are against LGBT even though that is the manifesto of Pakatan. Now what it looks like is and showing a news article where you showed that you voted against this legislation by Pakatan by virtue of the fact that you owed something to constituency. Those things, crucially, form a barrier to Pakatan enacting their own policies. So that was something they never to deal with. Fifth reason, political maneuvering. How does political maneuvering work? If you want your policy to be passed, you also want a quid pro quo. That means that you want another politician to do something for you if you want that the politicians vote. So what that looks like is you not only get Pakatan, you don't only get like Amno politicians doing bad things, but you also get Pakatan Harapan governments voting against progressive policies as well because they want the Amno politician to eventually help them in legislation. So five reasons why, on principle, not only is this unjust because the people not end up being represented, but two, you end up fighting against progressive norms as well. By the way, the idea of democracy applies even if the ruling government is corrupt, even if the ruling government is extremely unprogressive because presumably people deserve a right to translate their preferences into policy. Yeah. Please answer this because it's very important. At the moment in time where the politician feels their political affiliation is being disrupted, why is the option still not existing on the outside? I don't know. Maybe if you're sick of corruption, you can stop corrupting, right? <laughs> like, why is the translation, if you feel a disturbance in your policy, why is the solution to that immediately party hopping? Why not change your policies? Why not fight for legislation in that party? There's a billion things people can do other than party hopping, which affects that party. It's just unclear to me why party hopping is the solution here. Which brings me to my next P, power. Let's talk about freedom of political expression. 
for you to buy this argument, you have to buy that you can't, like, you can't change your stances without party hopping. This is categorically untrue because the politician is so corrupt. Corrupt, you can still reflect a lack of, like, you can still reflect progressive norms in your policies, even if you are sick of corruption. That was something they never wanted to deal with. Secondly, you can still repent without party hopping. That means that you still represent your constituency as well. So I don't see why the freedom of political expression is such a big deal on the death side of the house. Third, often this politician was in fact complicit in corruption, even the like progressive ones. Often it's about turning a blind eye to like Azmin Ali funneling billion. Oh my God, this stream. Azmin Ali funneling money out of like Felda into different uh, into, into his own uh, into personal bank accounts. And what that looks like is extreme levels of corruption. If the trade off here is this politician not end up being able to party hop, we're fine with that because we don't want this politician in the first place because of how complicit they have been. But thirdly, I just want to address. Do political stances even just change like water? Is it that transient? I would say it's in fact already solidified. If I win this, that means that I prove that chances are this politician changed his mind not out of an altruistic reason to change the political stance, but rather just due to malicious political strategy. Number one, the birth lottery and the fact that often individuals are geographically proximate to individuals who are like similar to them. This means that already through the tumultuous period of like adolescence, they've already formed their political beliefs as well. Secondly, um, most of the parts that exist that these politicians are beholden to are often echo chambers. Look at Kelantan, for example, where individuals coalesce to a certain policy as well. Two reasons why politicians do not have um, the are not likely to change altruistically. So they have to deal with the idea on power. Given the government loses power because of the iconography of the perception of having other politicians entering into the party, that's the perception and the ruling government end up losing power, they deal with that. But lastly, even if you don't buy up that, let's talk about the trade-off. Why do we care about the policies of this party staying consistent? Let's be very clear about what happens in our worst case scenario. In our worst case scenario, if we lose power, you still end up winning the municipality and the district that exists in those societies. And how that looks like is that you still represent the people on a district level but crucially your message is not is no longer impure your message is not tainted by a different party telling you what to do the reason why it's preferable because it means it's the enclave of progression it means the space for individuals to enjoy freedoms that don't exist otherwise the comparative is a slango mp being influenced by the pakistan whip and being forced to vote along a tainted message crucially that's better because of the trade-off of options yes they're enclave for backwards believers as well but they don't get power under the status quo Crucially, you have to remember this debate is about democracy. They never dealt with that on the death side of the house. Very proud. I think it's very convenient for Kales to tell us that if you didn't want your party to be corrupted, then you should have just stopped the corruption that happened within your party. We think this ignores the realities of politics, especially throughout the whole world, because this doesn't just apply to Malaysia, but it applies universally throughout all across democratic systems. But we tell you, who are these individuals who are likely going to party hop? It's not your individuals who are your extreme right or your extreme left who are very loyal to your parties. 
but rather it's individuals who are within the grey lines. Yeah. Your centre left, your centre right. These are the individuals who are actually willing to make the trade-off of their own values and actually willing to fight for the other parties. So what this means is that it's most likely individuals who, they're not individuals who were Najib's right-hand man or individuals within the top administration, but rather the individuals within the low-tier political system and these individuals had no power in determining, determining the values of your political party in changing significantly the values of your party. We don't think that individual had the capacity to do that. Okay. So the only option at this point in time was that individual must now change the party so that they can represent their own values, so that they can represent their own political beliefs. Yeah. And think that is within that individual's inherent right in a democratic system to be able to represent whatever personal beliefs that they relate themselves to. So okay. let's firstly deal with the amount of uh, analysis that came from side opposite uh, government. So the first thing that they say was that oh, politicians follow their own personal beliefs, therefore it's bad. The first is that I say no, it's actually good. Yes, politicians follow their own personal beliefs. You just describe every democratic system that existed. You represent your own personal values and whoever shares the similar values that you have. So what? this is a good thing, right? So if you do, but what you do under your side of the house, you force individuals to f follow a certain type of value and never change their opinions at all. Insofar as we can prove to you that values and personal beliefs can change due to things like, for example, education, due to things like, for example, media exposure towards like more corruption or being able to find more proof that the party that you were previous in, previously in was also corrupt. These are things that are legitimate reasons for individuals to party hop. But even in the worst case scenario where individuals party hop because of convenience, then we are willing to take the trade-off because that is their own personal right for them to represent whatever it is that they believe in in a democratic system. So even if they think but that is a good political strategy we're willing to take make that trade off but last secondly they say oh but, but your primary obligation is to the people therefore you have an obligation to stick to your party and your life values this also doesn't reflect the realities of a democratic system because we told you politicians change their ideas and values all the time mahade himself changed his ideas and uh, changed his values because he knew that there was a bigger fight to fought, be, to be fought that's why he party hop into uh, Pakistan and Harapan and that party hop that happened with Mahade increased huge amount of voters into the party because it was seen as more legitimate but lastly we say yeah, but secondly we say your obligation is not to your party but rather to your people so if your personal belief is that what is that you believe that your party is disappointing the people is no longer serving that people then it's your inherent right to jump ship into a party that you believe is ma far more cap capable in serving the people. We think this inherent right extends to a democratic system. But lastly, they tell us this was a ridiculous argument. They say that it ruins political reform because these individuals are likely going to bring in values from your previous party. The first I would say is that one, I'm not sure why this is bad because in a democratic system, if you have diverse political values within a party and people would vote you in, that's not a bad thing. But secondly, if you are so extreme and you bring in all the extreme values of like BN into um, Pakatan Harapan, all your Pakatan Harapan voters would not vote you in anyway because you believe they believe that these individuals don't represent the values of their party. So even if you are affiliated to this party and you don't represent the values of this party, it's likely that the supporters of these parties will not vote you in anyway. So even in the, they haven't proven to us why exactly they would ex suddenly bring in their extremist values or corruption into these parties. They haven't proven that. Therefore, that harm does not materialize. So, what is the principal argument that we brought to you in this debate? The first thing we would say is that why it's uh, okay, why it's likely for change. Like, why is it likely for p p political spheres to be more diverse? Because they tell us that it's unlikely for politicians to change their values because of two reasons. One, echo chambers, and second, birth lottery. 
I don't see any correlation of echo chambers and birth lottery to individuals suddenly not being able to change their values yeah. and change their mindsets. But how do we prove to you that individuals have the capacity to change their values over time? It's things like, for example, education. The fact that more people are getting more and more informed means that it's more likely that politicians also learn new things like progressivism, things like maybe looking at Western worlds and realizing that there are policies that can be implemented into your world. It's things like, for example, more media, uh, uh, more media uh, scrutiny towards your party. Maybe realizing that there's more proof that your party is corrupt. Maybe there's like. Um, what do you call it? Like, yeah, more media attention, right? These are things that can specifically happen. So it's, it's individuals who are within the low party tier that find out that perhaps their party isn't what they what they meant to be as well. So it's it's likely that their values their values might change as well. But see, but this re also responds to what they say about PH. Oh, but PH toned down their liberal ideas because their party hop they party hop. This is just not a nonsense, right? Because PH has never supported. LGBT rights never support outrightly support things like feminist value that has never been inherent in the manifestos of PH but the second thing when it comes to backing down manifestos it wasn't because more all the AMNO people came into uh, came into PH that happened way before that right they did it for many reasons things like for example <coughs> pressure by rural individuals who control the majority of the uh, voter bloc Things like pressure from individual uh, lobbying from poli other politicians as well as like, <coughs> yeah, politicians. So these are reasons as to why po uh, like this won't happen anyway. But lastly, we say, in so far as we can prove to you that individuals, the same way voters are allowed to vote for different parties every election, we think the same amount of right should be given to politicians if they want to do so. We think a democratic system should represent that. We're proud to oppose. I know it's going to be hard for you to imagine this, but try imagining you're an AMNO supporter who, and in your district, you, uh, you voted in an AMNO uh, politician. Then imagine in their world that AMNO politician suddenly jumping ship, suddenly changing your stance after he had promised you that he would do things like, for example, protect Malay's party or the interests of you as a voter and instead change your stance and go into PH and moderate your stance. Wouldn't you feel as a voter extremely betrayed by the fact that this politician is like, uh, values power more over than the constituency that they're beholden to? We think that side opposition is defending the world in which politicians are able to do that and we think that it is morally reprehensible for them to do so. Two issues I want to talk about in this debate move before I move on to the trade-off, right? Which is firstly the freedom of political expression. Is it really worth it? And then secondly, about power consolidation and why we think that it's not really that important in the debate. And lastly, why the most important thing in this debate uh, in the trade-off, right? Okay, let's talk about freedom of political expression. They said that they want to defend uh, politicians being able to politically express. Khalid has, Khalid has told you multiple reasons as to how exactly these people are more likely to be able to, uh, they can stay, uh, like there are multiple alternatives as to these people instead of just simply party hopping, staying in the uh, politi pol uh, party and maybe changing the stance. Like for example, KJ, right? Uh, Khairi Jamaluddin, right? Where he doesn't agree with a lot of PN stances, but he didn't leave the party. He tried to change it with, within. He uh, he let go of a position of a high power to go into a low position in order to uh, change the political message and criticize the party. We think that that is a valid option for these people to do so, right? For these politicians to do so, right? But secondly, they try to tell you why it's like politicians are more likely to change their stances. Realize that the convenience in this statement because the status quo is that politicians and party hoppers are likely to party hop in instances where they lose the election. E.g. like for example when PH and AMNO, right? They have to tell us examples as to why exactly politicians who like I don't know in the middle of two elections right they suddenly don't party hop even though elections weren't around they're most likely to party hop because elections uh, because of the loss in elections right so 
this means that they're more likely be, be, they want to do it because they change, uh, but uh, they, because of power be, because they want to maintain their power but even then Kalis has provided you multiple reasons as to why exactly these people are unlikely to change their stance he tell, told you like two reasons which is birth lottery and echo chambers the reason why it's relevant is because that Khalis already explained to you that these people are more like these people uh, political views and political stances usually are formed at the point in which they are uh, in like from where they are born for example the families that the type of families they are born to for example if you're born into a conservative family you're more likely to grow up being conservative or uh or the other way around, right? Or echo chambers within parties, especially where people, uh, part politicians are within the party, are more likely to uh, only get information that uh, only further reinforces the view or political stance they currently have. So these are reasons exactly why they are unlikely to change their stance. We think that they have only simply brushed off these reasons and are uh, un uh, able, like these, are, they have only brushed off these reasons and not properly engaged with it. We think that these are. Uh, this, uh, these arguments stand, right? So, what is the reality then, right? We think that in status quo, the reason why Pakatan Harapan or any po politician party is willing to take in, uh, willing, to di uh, willing to dilute their message is because they want to incentivize party hoppers to come in, right? This has led to, part for example, Pakatan Harapan diluting their message when they promise to take away the Sedition Act, when they promise to take away uh, GL uh, GLC funding, etc. Right? They have none. Not, they have not done, uh, completed that promise. This is the reason why is because they want to attract. Uh, they wanted to protect party hoppers, and uh, at the end of the day, and they want a big party hoppers in order to consolidate power and in order for that to. Uh, when we take that away, when we disable, we disallow politicians from being able to party hop, this means that their incentive goes away. What does this mean then? This means that Pakatan Harapan or any ruling government has zero incentive to dilute their message and they only have to cater to the voter base. And we think that we protect the principle of democracy best at the end of the day. Even before that, sure, any one of you. Um, so, if you're an UMNO supporter and a minister you support suddenly jumps and you're dissatisfied with that, why can't you just vote them out? Realize that in elections, right? Imagine you vote for uh, like you vote for a politician because they make promises and they broke that promise. Why are you defending the politician instead of the voter who was lied to at the end of the day? And they have to wait four years in order for them to be able to vote in a new person. We don't get why you want uh, we don't get that POI, right? Last, la second issue, right? Power consolidation. Realize that they never actually explain to us why exactly is it that these politicians, these parties actually need to consolidate power, right? They've only explained to us in vague details as to why exactly these politicians have some form of uh, moral adherence to protect the people or something. But they haven't proved to us structurally as to why these politicians are most likely to uh, want to protect, uh, protect the, the voter base, right? On our side, we're saying to you that these politicians uh, these politicians need to cater to the voter base by simply staying to the party that they were voted in for, for the fact that they are stunts, right? So what's the trade-off then, right? The trade-off is that we're not able, like, sure, pol ruling parties won't be able to concentrate the power that easily, but that trade-off, uh, but we're able to maintain purity when it comes to, um, and whatever freedom of political expression that they try to talk to you about, right? Realize that, Okay, even in the best case scenario where we have to trade off freedom of political expression of these political uh, politicians, this is why it's more, it's not, uh, we're willing to trade it off in order for the, uh, the voters, right? Realize that voters are the ones who are innocent here. We've already proven to you why exactly politicians are somewhat complicit to a certain degree when they are within a party, for example, BN, when they don't burden about the uh, corruption, right? The voters who voted in the politicians are the people who are innocent and the people who want to see their message and their values being properly represented. What happens on their side? Their side is where voters get hoodwinked, get uh, lied to, where politicians simply want to fight for power and simply want to party hop because they want to remain in power and they are forced to uh, both the ruling party and the party hopping politicians have to change their stances in order to accommodate for power we think that in our world we were able to protect the principle of democracy where people's uh, values are actually being represented in po uh, politics in their world they don't get that we're only able to protect some form of minute political freedom of political expression for these politicians uh, etc for all those reasons go with side gov uh, government
Pools. Madam Chair, the reason why my POI is really important because there needs to be a metric in a way in which side government has to prove when this a politician, politician suddenly changes its political affiliation and why that option needs to be the, that option needs to be there at a point in time where they have changed their political affiliation. We notice that this debate happens in a lot of contexts, and it wasn't our fault. It was their fault because the context of somehow there are certain governments who are benevolent, somehow there are certain governments who are corrupt. Notice the harms are symmetrical on both sides. Therefore, necessarily the debate then happens on a democratic system. Them, what is the best way to maximize the potential utility onto voters? Two questions. Why is this option needs to be there? Second, why is it better to prioritize voters and how do necessary voters essentially vote at the end of the day? Before there are a few points of clarification that I need to make. The first thing that I need to make this is the debate is about the first thing I need to clarify is the context where the debate operates. This debate operates in some form of governmental uh, power, which means there are some form of regulations, there are some form of corrupt party, which means that the harms of saying that oh our side will be much more corrupt yes can uh, somehow circumvent the correction does not come at the expense where this option is the causation of that corrupt uh, corrupt politicians being there in the first place which means that if you do not allow party hopping at the end of the day these corruption politicians will still be in your parties and keep emboldening the corrupt narrative within those instances but secondly the second thing that is really important to point out is that this debate also happens in terms of a principal clash of way in which democratic states work. Things, for example, that was being flagged out in LO and DLO, which completely di did not engage by them. Things, for example, having that political expression being important to you as an integral politician to represent your constituency in of itself. On Two this. questions. Sit down. Why this option needs to be there? The first thing that I want to say was that it violates the mandate of the people because it happens after the election. The first thing I would say is that oftentimes the mandate of the people is also can be can also be interpreted in a law office. If their standard is manifestos, a lot of MPs do not even fulfill their manifestos every day at the end of the day. But second, when politicians also get into power, they oftentimes change their political affiliation, they oftentimes change their manifestos every day. This two standard proves that if you want to say that the manifesto is the standard in which you want to ban party hopping laws, you also cannot have that vague standard because we cannot determine the intention of politicians at the end of the day. So your two standards of saying that birth lottery and echo chamber, it is it's not as though suddenly when you have a past MP suddenly they want to go to Pakatan Harapan, that doesn't mean that Pakatan Harapan will not have any say to suddenly accept past, uh, a past MP every day. We think that under our side of the house also, the option of your Pakatan Harapan to accept to accept certain politicians is also there and it's also evident in the context that you guys wanted to set up when Mahade did not want to accept certain MPs because there was some form of proof of immeasurable by these MPs. These options exist on a mitigated basis to circumvent all your corrupt harms of suddenly MP politicians changing the legislation to not accept progressive policies. Take a seat. The second thing they wanted to say that politicians need to be loyal to the people because these are individuals who live in echo chambers and therefore birth lottery. Notice that this debate, notice that this characterization does not prove the causation of their harm because their harm was that there is a corrupt politician, therefore they need to fix the, the burning ship. I would tell you, and also this being stated in Iman and Asha's speech, they which you do not engage at all, that that burning ship is not, is not like, is not valuable enough, it's not valuable enough for you to say. Because their argument was that, look, you can be like KJ. If, you're, if you say that the incentive structure will always be voters, then the incentive structure will also exist on the outside of the house. So if you're a shit politician, these are also individuals who will vote these politicians, politicians out. The debate then happens when there is a clash of interest of you as a politician and your party. What happens there and then? They did not answer that question at the end of the day. But the second thing they said that, look, these are individuals who will consolidate power because at the point in time where they feel it is strategic inconvenient for them to do so. And this was the biggest harm. We told you that it's good. At least on the outside of the house, these are politicians who discharge themselves from the affiliation of uh, affiliating with corruption. These are individuals who discharge themselves from all the non like progressive, the form of harms that you guys want to talk about at the end of the day. At least on the outside of the house, if it's true that we want to protect protect constituency, we can do that better on the outside of the house when they feel at the point in time where the trust and the mandate of the people is being disrupted, we have that option to change that. So the comparative on the both sides of the house, given that the harms are symmetrical we can have that consolidation of power also it comes at the expense of this petition being better at the end of the day sure let's assume everything opposition said is true opposition deserve a right to freedom of, uh, freedom of politics 
we have to weigh it up against the individual collective right of everyone in this room to have your preferences translated into policy. Deal with that. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't understand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we had a counter principle about like uh -huh. collective rights, people like you, blah, 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 like doing policies, translating, yeah. Yeah. deal with that versus your politician stuff. I also don't understand again. <laughs> sure, whatever. Like the second one, why is it better for these individuals to party hop? Because the main contention they had was that everybody will join. It, ch it sends a chilling effect and therefore it is harmful. But notice this is nitpicking because they said that oftentimes individuals who will party hop are individuals who are conservative, the hardcore right individuals. Iman told you that this oftentimes is not true. Your conservative or your hard right wing individuals will not party hop because these are individuals who are loyal to your BN, who are loyal to your past. past your past party at the end of the day because these are individuals who are hardcore. The point in which when we told you that these are individuals who are the individuals who are party hop is your is your centrist who thinks that at the point in time, oh, corruption is very bad, but suddenly I also have a, I have to be loyal to my party. These are the kinds of intrinsic value that exist with these individuals at that point in time where we don't allow this party hopping to be at, to be to be uh, existent on your side of the house. We we told you that these are more oftentimes individuals who will just not just not be better as a politician at the end of the day. But secondly, they also told us that look, if they are corrupt, necessarily they can change the party of the they can change the party of these people. In Ash's speech, it was really clear the principle is devoid is is divided out of outcome. They told we told you that inherent right of a politician means that they need to have this right to politically express their political ideologies and that comes at the expense of its constituency. When their constituency feels that the political ideology of your MP is not sufficient to a point whereby it could disrupt the whole mandate of the people, we think that their option needs to be there so that this politician can opt out of the political party at the end of the day. They disrupt that process and they disrupt the democratic system because they feel that there is no need for them to there is no need for them to party hop at the end of the day. So all in all, this debate has to be judged on a manner of which best maximizes the voters and the mandate of the people. For all the students, I beg to oppose. Thank you. So I think the biggest problem with side government is that one, they never wanted to engage in our context. What did we specifically told you? That the individuals who party hop are often individuals within the grey areas who, not are, who are not the extreme right but who are not the extreme left. They are individuals who are probably centre left and centre right and willing to make the trade off and go into a different party because they believe that this goes against the interests of the people. But second thing we told you is that we also support individuals who want to stay within their political uh, parties, right? If they want to stay in their political parties like KJ and reform their party from the inside, then okay, we support that. But what we have, the categorical difference, what side opposition has, is the ability for a politician to choose, an ability to choose that insofar as they, are they believe that their party no longer represents the people, that the values, they no longer relate to the values of that party, they have that choice. And that is what side government is depriving these individuals of. So two questions I will answer in this speech. The first is, does party hopping go against the values of democratic system, the principal clash of this debate? The second is, how do we ensure we maximize the political system so that we give individuals on the ground, voters what they want? So firstly, does it go against the values of a democratic system? Because their claim was that it's not right for politician to follow their own personal belief and they have a mandate to the people, they have an obligation to ensure what the people want because they voted in. The first thing is that 
in like what we said they said that oh people vote you in because of a certain reason so it's bad for you to go against whatever like if you jump ship right the first uh, we we the how we responded to this the first thing we said was that politicians change their beliefs all the time that's the nature of a democratic system people change their values change their policy policies they hold straight because that's what politicians do so values of a politi- pol- political belief of a politician is what they believe is good for the people so it's if they jump ship it's probably what they felt and what they feel is good for the people and ultimately that right to represent what they feel is a good choice is something that is inherent inside government there was no response to this inside uh, uh, inside government but the second thing is that second question is that how do we ensure we maximize the political system to give individuals better policies the first thing that they said was that it's ha- it's going to harm policies because now policies are going to be uh, you're going to carry in your previous policies into the new party like for example if you're from bn you're going to carry corruption into ph they gi- they give two reasons echo chamber and birth lottery the first i would say is that just because you were born in a certain conservative area doesn't mean your values cannot change i was born in shalam and my, i'm very liberal in comparison to all the individuals within my area it's also it's thing like echo chambers echo chambers no longer exist we told you in uh, takis speech the fact that it's easier for you to access information online it's easier for you to access things like edu- education etc we also told you that in my speech so things like echo chamber is no longer as prevalent as it was 20 30 years ago so this means that all the structural reasons as to why individuals are unlikely to change their values does not is not true and it's unlikely for us to believe them but secondly they say but their policies are so bad so let's take them at their best what if policies are so bad that we have uh, that these individuals no longer represent the parties that you believe or the values that you believe in you can just vote them out yeah. the next poli- the next election that is the nature of a democratic system yeah. when you believe a politician no longer represents your values when you believe that a politician is going against whatever it is that you vote for you vote them out it happens in both worlds and we think in our world the thing that it's exclusive under our side is the ability for politic- politicians to know that they can do better that they can change that if their values change they have an option to represent whatever they believe in more and it think that you deprive them of this choice you deprive them of the capacity to be able to represent what is most good for people and very proud to oppose yeah. The very worst case scenario in government is that a few politicians complicit with corruption lose an individual right. The worst case opposition side literally never even acknowledged on their side is the loss of an entirety of a nation's population, millions of individuals composed of different preferences losing a collective right. Having that right translated to a politician they never voted for. For you to buy their bizarre case, you'd have to buy that 70-year-old Nick Aziz Ahmad Kamal would change his political stance to suddenly love liberalism. They just wanted to hinge their case on this bizarre context where suddenly, magically, individuals in this altruistic world just suddenly start shifting their stances. I'm not going to remind you of the different ways we've proved that it affects the policy level on a federal nature, that how the nature of politics, the nature of parliamentary discussions often mean that the preferences of one politician affects the entire manifesto of Pakistan. I'll deal with the more egregious things they said and explicitly say why they can't get away with saying these things. First, Iman, in her reply speech, and to be fair, along the bench, says that, oh, why can't you just vote out this minister who is corrupt, right? Why can't, like, presumably this minister will just be voted out by, like, Pakatan voters? Literally, that does not respond to the context the government side was consistent on to begin with. The individual politicians were not voted out by the nation, they were voted out by their municipality and their constituent. That means that Pakatan Harapan voters can't vote out a formerly BN politician in Kelantan because there's no power to do so. That means that politician still caters to the constituency of a formerly BN disguised as Pakatan now nation. That means you don't have power to opt out those people, they have to engage with that context first. The next thing they say is that, ah, material from OPWIP, They're like, what about regulation? Because Mahathir does not allow ministers with corruption to, to party hop. They can't get away with this because they knife their own case. 
If it is true that politicians all deserve a freedom of expression, why are you making that exception for politicians who are corrupt? Why are you making the exception to politicians who don't shift their stances? Literally, their case only applies to this narrow context where politicians have shifted their stances. They have to defend this freedom of expression where politician is corrupt. It's bizarre that that is the line. They never proved to us why that is the line. Lastly, let's talk about political freedom. For you to buy this argument, you need to weigh up how much they deserve freedom versus how much individuals deserve representation. Note, I already proved to you why it's extremely narrow context, but I think we're able to prove to you to a certain degree that the tainting of political manifestos translates to the wishes of the people, transforming to the wishes of a party they never voted for. Presumably they can see that because they ne literally never acknowledged it. I think we're also able to prove significant doubt in all three of your panels like heads to <laughs> make you believe that Party hopping is not a genuine result of political expression, but rather a matter of convenience. And the reason why that matters is because if it's not a result of your genuine political stance, they can't then make the claim that individuals deserve a right to expression because it's a matter of convenience. If you hinge your entire case on analysis as to why individuals deserve political right, you can't then say that matter matters of convenience is okay. We prove to this to four reasons. That first, if individuals were suddenly so woke to believe that their party is wrong, then presumably they can make a stance as well. KJ already proves... I'm, you're not KJ, but Arshad says KJ and that proves it. But secondly, we already proved to you complicity to a certain degree. The individuals were silent in the face of all this corruption. Presumably, that's to be balanced against the innocent individuals and innocent citizens who never had a hand in those things. But thirdly, like on the whole, individuals have already solidified their personal political stance. It's not that echo chambers don't exist, but because if you grow up with a certain population who acknowledges a certain way and transform that with the fact that after a certain number of years you solidified your stances, then it's just unlikely to happen. All in all, what that introduces is doubt. Doubt that these politicians in fact translated their real wishes, but rather as a matter of convenience. In weighing, government side was consistent in that it should weigh up the private right of an individual, each and every one of us in this room, for the possibility of freedom from a one-party rule. There was something they never wanted to engage with. We told you to trade off. Roshan, learn your advice, trade offs. Trade offs are good. The trade off that we acknowledge was that yes, sometimes it's a really shit government, but the difference is on the outside of the house, there's, a con there's like one constituent and enclave where you can enjoy the freedom from that corrupt government. That's why we win, that's why we take the debate.